Welcome to Back to the Bible Radio, featuring best-selling author and internationally known Bible teacher Warren Wearsby. If you could choose to join one of the churches in the New Testament, uh, which one would you choose? Probably not the church at Corinth. There were too many problems and divisions there. We don't want to get involved in all of that. Maybe Philippi, in spite of the fact that two women there were having a public disagreement. But I wonder if the church at Philadelphia, found in Revelation chapter 3, wouldn't be a good choice. It wasn't a large church. It wasn't a famous church. But it was a faithful church, and it had some wonderful doors of opportunity opened for ministry. The Lord Jesus said this to the a pastor of the church at Philadelphia, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation or testing, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. This sounds like a good church, doesn't it? A working church. It wasn't big. They just had a little strength, but they were faithful. And God gave to them some open doors of ministry. But I like verse 10 of Revelation chapter 3, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. That's an interesting name for the word of God. The word of my patience. Now this word patience does not mean passive waiting like a sick person in a hospital bed. It really means endurance, brave perseverance, uh, more like a soldier on the battlefield, a soldier who just won't give up. You know, anyone can sit around and do nothing. Anybody can be a quitter. But a Christian should have endurance and keep on going even when things are difficult. Well, there are two important lessons that come to us from this name for the Bible, the word of my patience. Lesson number one, God knows that we need patience. You may say, well, Mr. Wearsby, I'm, I'm a relatively patient person. Well, I congratulate you because there are times when I am not. I think that the Word of God teaches that we need patience. We need patience with God. Patience with God. You know, we get impatient with the Lord himself. Now, don't say you don't because you do. You go through your Bible and you find the saints of God saying, why, when? How long? I once went through the book of Psalms and marked all the places where they said, How long? In Revelation chapter 6, those martyrs said, How long before you're going to uh, revenge our blood upon the earth? Abraham got impatient and ran ahead of the Lord and sinned against the Lord. Throughout the word of God, you find some of the greatest people of God getting impatient. Peter got impatient, didn't he? Almost killed a man. But you know, God is patient, the word of my patience. Even though you and I are uh, impatient, God is patient. There's an interesting statement in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. Let me read it to you now. 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. But another way to translate it is like this, into the patience of Christ. You say, well, certainly our Lord Jesus Christ, glorified in heaven, does not need to be patient. Well, you must remember that the Lord Jesus Christ is waiting for that time when he shall return and claim his bride. I have married a great many couples in my ministry, and so often you find them getting impatient. Oh, we can hardly wait until the Lord brings us together as husband and wife. I read in Hebrews chapter 10, talking about the Lord Jesus, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down, 
on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. What's the Lord Jesus doing today? Patiently expecting. He is waiting for that time when he shall consummate God's great plan of redemption and we shall enter into glory with him. God is patient, and the word of God reveals to us the patience of God. Do you know why God is patient? It's a good thing he is because some of us might not be saved. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, why the Lord is patient. There are those who say, well, where is the promise of his coming? Everything is going on the way it always has gone on. And Peter says this, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know why the Lord is being patient? To give you an opportunity to be saved and to give you and me opportunities to share salvation's wonderful message with others. Oh, we need to be patient with the Lord. How many times in our praying we've said, Lord, when are you going to do something? When are you going to answer? Secondly, we need to be patient with ourselves and with others. Usually we're more patient with ourselves than we are with other people. Uh, We commit certain sins or we have certain failings, and, and that's all right. But when other people do it, it's not all right, and we get rather critical. You know, those of us who are in ministry, oh, we have such high ideals, don't we? And we should. We should have the highest possible ideals. We want to grow in grace. We want to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, We want that our Christian character shall grow. We want to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. Deep within our hearts, we do want to be conformed to the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to be clean vessels that he can use for his glory. We want to be fruitful branches in the vine, bearing fruit that God might be glorified. These are the high ideals that we have. But alas, we don't always reach them, do we? The things we don't want to do, we do, and the things we say we should do, we don't do. And we cry out with Paul in Romans chapter 7, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? We get impatient with ourselves. We feel like quitting. We say, well, why pray anymore? Why read the Bible? I'm not attaining all of the high ideals that I've set for myself. Well, don't get discouraged. You never will attain any of this until the Lord Jesus comes. Now keep aiming high. Don't let your standards get lowered. Just keep on walking with the Lord. My guess is that uh, you're growing more than you think you are. You, You may not see it, but other people see it. When Moses came down from the mountaintop, he didn't even know that his own face was shining. And you may not know how much your Christian life is improving, but you get impatient with yourself. You get impatient with others. Oh, there are people in our lives who are abrasive. Somehow they are just human sandpaper that rubs against us and rubs the wrong way. And we get impatient with people, and we wonder, why doesn't the Lord change them when all the while he really wants to change us? We need patience with God, and we need patience with ourselves so we don't quit, get discouraged. We need patience with others. There's somebody in your church who just breaks your heart. Don't be impatient. Perhaps somebody in your family and you're crying out to God and saying, Oh, God, help that person to grow up. Help that one to get into the place of your will. And nothing seems to be happening. Well, be patient. This past summer, uh, my wife and I visited some old friends, people who have known us for many, many years. And he told me an interesting story. He said that there was a little plant back by their garage, and he wondered what it was. And someone said, Well, it's an apple tree. And so he dug up that little plant and he planted it next to the house where it would get nourishment and sunshine and water. He said, for years, nothing happened. There it stood. But he said, one spring, that thing began to blossom. And he said, ever since then, we've had a wonderful supply of apples from that tree. He said, now I want to tell you something about your ministry. Don't get impatient. Just keep preaching and keep praying and keep working and let God worry about the fruit. 
I think sometimes we need patience with difficult circumstances. This church was about to go through uh, some difficult circumstances, and God said, now look, I'm going to be with you. There are trials that test us. There are tribulations that try us. There are personal hurts and pains. Oh, we need patience. Oh, we need patience. Revelation 3.10 says that that patience comes through the Word of God. There's a parallel statement found over in the book of Romans, chapter 15 and verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, meaning the Old Testament scriptures, were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Jesus Christ. The word of patience introduces the God of patience, and the word of patience is used by the God of patience to give you and me patience and encouragement. Patience and comfort of the scriptures. That word comfort means encouragement. And so patience comes through the word of God. Now you know this, but let me remind you of it. When you find yourself getting impatient, read the word of God. I'll tell you why. The word of God reveals the greatness of God. You know, I usually get impatient over petty little things, just petty little things. Uh, Some little thing happens while I'm shopping or while I'm driving. Something happens to uh, the automobile or something happens at home. It's, It's usually just some petty little thing that makes us get impatient and all worked up. The Word of God reveals the greatness of God. Oh, our God is so great, enthroned in heaven. His eyes see everything. His hands can do everything. He is everywhere. Oh, the greatness of God. Whatever it is that's making you impatient and unstable today, just remember, God is great. He is high and lifted up. And all of the earth is filled with his glory, whether we see it or not. More than that, The Word of God is the Word of His patience because it reveals to us God's plan for the ages. We know what it is God intends to do. We don't know when He's going to do everything. We don't even understand how He's going to work it out. That's not important. We know that He is in control, and as we read the Word of God, we find out what His plan is. When you read the Word of God, it gives you patience because you realize God is working out His plan, something else. The Word of His patience reveals His promises to us. I like the promises of God. We don't live on explanations. We live on promises. And, oh, the promises of God have a way of calming my heart. Be still and know that I am God. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. And you know, when the water of the word flows over my soul, it just cleanses and quiets my heart, and it enables me to wait. Oh, how I need that. You see, the work of God must be in the will of God, done for the glory of God, And to do something for the glory of God, you have to do it his way, in his time, with his strength. And you may want to do God's will, but rush ahead. And the word of God reveals to us his promises, something else. When I read the word of God, I see what he's done for other people. Oh, I get so encouraged. It makes me just calm down. When I see what he did for Abraham and for Isaac and Jacob especially, my, oh my, what he had to do for Jacob. When I read Hebrews 11 and see how God worked in the lives of these people, we read Hebrews 11 and say, well, they were all super saints. Oh no, they were ordinary, everyday people, but they conquered by faith. And who did it? God did. God worked in their lives. And so the word of his patience says to you, now be patient, I'm at work in your life. I'm accomplishing my purposes. You don't see all that I'm doing. You want to rush over and do this and rush around and do that. But uh, I'm at work in your life. Just as I took Gideon, who was scared to death, hiding there in the, uh, in the wine press. Uh, and, and I made out of him a great general. 
I can take you and make out of you a, a Sunday school teacher, a pastor, a missionary, a servant of the Lord, a faithful Christian. You see, what we need is just to trust God. And when you trust God, you have patience. Faith and patience go together, don't they? Hebrews 6.12 says that. Through faith and patience we inherit the promises. And faith comes from the Word of God, and patience comes from the Word of God. And so if you're getting nervous and you're about to rush ahead of God and do some dumb thing, take time to read his word. The word of promise, Romans chapter 9, verse 9. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. This promise was made to Abraham. Now that's a wonderful name for the Bible, the word of promise. And when you realize that your Bible is the word of promise, it will bring to your life two very wonderful blessings. Blessing number one, the blessing of assurance. God can be trusted. Now let me ask you, what is the source of your assurance? Uh, if somebody stopped you and said, that, look, uh, if you um, were killed today, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? What assurance do you have? Now, there are people whose assurance is simply in their feelings. They say, well, I just feel like God has saved me. I just feel as though uh, I'm one of his children. I feel like I'm going to heaven. Well, feelings are important. There is a joy and a satisfaction in the Christian life, but your feelings are, can be very treacherous. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And somebody says, well, if I know my own heart, and Jeremiah says, yeah, but you don't know your own heart. Nobody really knows his heart. Feelings are just a little bit dangerous, aren't they? Someone else says, well, my mother told me I was saved when I was four years old. But your mother might be wrong. A Sunday school teacher said, well, you're saved. I know you're born again, but your Sunday school teacher might be wrong. I don't know of anywhere in the Bible where we're told that we tell other people that they're saved. The Holy Spirit does that, doesn't he? The Holy Spirit bears witness in our hearts that we belong to the Lord Jesus. Somebody says, well, I'm living a good life. There have been some changes in my life since I've started going to church. But even that is not enough. Uh, there are many people who reform their lives who never really have received God's eternal life. What is your source of assurance? Well, the Word of God is our source of assurance. We know that God keeps His promises. You see, we could bring a long line of witnesses and have these witnesses affirm to you that God keeps His promises. Let's begin with uh, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. That's the context of Romans chapter 9. Paul is writing about the, the birth of Isaac and the birth of uh, Jacob and the, and the birth of uh, Esau, and he's talking about all of these important events in, in Jewish history, and he says that these things happen because of God's promises. If Abraham were here, he would say, I'll tell you one thing, God keeps his promises. Not always on my schedule, but he keeps his promises. He promised me that Sarah would have a son, and Sarah had a son. Then he promised that there would be two children born of Rebekah, and they were born. He keeps his promises, says Abraham, and certainly he ought to know. He walked with God for so many, many years. There's a verse over in Joshua that has always encouraged me. Joshua chapter 23 Verse 14, Joshua is giving his farewell address. This is what he says, And behold, this day I am going the way of all the earth. And ye know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing hath failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spake concerning you. All are come to pass unto you, and not one thing hath failed thereof. In Joshua chapter 21, uh, verse 45, we read, There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel all came to pass. In other words, Joshua says, well, if you'll ask me, I'll tell you God keeps his promises. Joshua saw God keep his promises throughout the uh, 
wanderings in the wilderness and throughout the conquest of Canaan. Let's go to Solomon, the wisest king who ever lived. 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 56. Solomon is dedicating the temple. Now here's what he says. Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. That Hebrew word failed is the word fallen. He's saying there has not fallen to the ground one word, not even one word, let alone a whole promise or a whole chapter. Not one little word of his promise has fallen to the ground. Every promise he makes stands, and you can trust it. The Apostle Paul had the same thing to say when he was preaching in the synagogue uh, verse 32 of Acts chapter 13, And we declare unto you glad tidings, good news, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. So Paul says God keeps his promises. You say, well, I know that. Well, it's true. God keeps his promises. And the promises of God do not fail. Romans chapter 15 and verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. So Jesus Christ did not break any of the promises. The Lord Jesus Christ came and confirmed the promises of God. That's the first blessing that comes to you when you realize that the Bible is the word of promise. You have assurance. You simply believe what God says, and that takes care of it. God said it, and we believe it, and that settles it. The wonderful blessing of assurance. Oh, let's lay hold of His promises. Let's live by the promises of God, because there has not failed one word of all His good promises. We're glad you joined us today. If you missed part of the program or you'd like to listen again, just come to backtothebible.org for more wisdom from God's Word. Back to the Bible, leading you forward in your relationship with Jesus Christ.